Hey everybody, we are live. Uh, I'll start. I'll start on time in a minute. I don't. I want to give the extra minute for the people to find the room. But like I was saying, thanks everyone for finding this meeting room now that they shut down the gates from the exit hall. Um, it's an adventure getting here. <laughs> so here we go. We're starting. Um, Welcome to my talk. My name is Jess Belletta. Uh, I'm actually a um, technical community advocate uh, at iSurveillant, now Cisco. Um, and I'm here to talk to you. I'm going to read the title. The key value of etcd over custom resources, scalability for now. So why am I talking about scalability? I am not a practitioner. I do not run Kubernetes clusters. I'm not a maintainer for any of the projects I'm going to talk about. I am associated with Cilium um, um, as a technical advocate. And so that means I am concerned about making sure end users and the project are aligning, right? And I am talking about this because there is an opportunity for practitioners, people with technical expertise running clusters, to help all the CNCF projects tackle the issue of scalability uh, by providing testing. And I'm going to use Cilium as an example of what I'm talking about. Um, this is a Cilium uh, state scalability story. I'm not talking about eBPF or the superpower that it is to provide performance inside your nodes. I'm talking about how you, um, how the state of Cilium state impacts scalability um, inside a cluster and across multiple clusters. So, this is mostly for the people on watching the video and not for everyone here. Uh, this is the cast of characters. Uh, these are the things I'll be mentioning um, that impact uh, the scalability story for Cilium and probably much of it uh, will impact other projects. Um, so Cilium is an eBPF powered uh, connectivity, observability and security platform uh, for Kubernetes clusters. Uh, like I said, I'm not gonna go into the details of EPF, but EPF is uh, uh, basically makes your kernel, uh, the Linux kernel programmable, and Cilium takes advantage of that to do enhanced um, networking performance uh, inside your Kubernetes nodes, right? So from that, you're able to get uh, transparent encryption, advanced load balancing, transparent observability. Um, all of that stuff falls out of the fact that we are using EPF underneath and building capabilities on top of it. If you're not familiar with Cilium, it is not a sales pitch, uh, but please check out the project if you're not familiar with it. But I'm talking about it here because that's the project I'm most familiar with. And I'm going to talk about some of the scalability issues uh, associated with uh, custom CRD or custom resource use by this project. So the other project that's the key player in the story is the actual Kubernetes API server, right? It, we all interact with this when we are maintaining or customizing our uh, Kubernetes clusters. Uh, it provides a suite of features. Uh, uh, one of those is the, um, the custom resource definitions by which other components can extend the API to include new resources that they can then, uh, op operators uh, can manage those resources and do exciting new things inside of your cluster, right? So, you know, ultimately, uh, all Kubernetes resources are exposed via this API and backed by keys uh, in an etcd value, key value store. Which brings me to etcd. This is the beating heart of Kubernetes. And I have an opinion that, uh, statement at the bottom. I think etcd is sort of an unsung hero inside the project landscape. Almost, it's probably the most downloaded CNCF project because almost all, almost all, Kubernetes clusters are going to end up using this. And it is how we collectively keep up with state inside the cluster so that um, you get a, every node gets a consistent view of the resources. Um, and that means um, you uh, should be able to rely on it when you're doing CRDs. And it turns out we can't at the scales of some of our users are using uh, Kubernetes and Cilium managed Kubernetes nodes, uh, clusters. Kubernetes um, custom resource definitions. Uh, this is um, the thing that uh, other components can add to the Kubernetes API server. So you can access all the greatness 
that is baked into Kubernetes IP server. So I just want to mention it. This is, this is how Cilium and other projects will extend the API uh, so that you can use the exact same mechanisms that you would do for core objects like nodes or services. Cilium has a whole fleet of, of uh, CRDs that we um, um, add to the API to get things done. Most of that is just config management, but a couple of those things are sort of critical uh, to how the Cilium CNI operates. So, like I said, this is a story. Act one, scalability in a single Cilium managed cluster. So the state of Cilium state. You know, what does Cilium keep as state? So there's no local state, which is what you need to hold on to if you restart the Cilium agent so you can continue, so the EVPF programs can continue to do their work on a node and they can actually route um, packets from one node outside of the world. That is, uh, doesn't have to be kept globally. It's, uh, it's sort of a solved problem. Uh, configuration state, the bulk of what state uh, Cilium needs is sort of um, policy, right? Human managed uh, state, things that you will edit to configure how Cilium operates. Um, Cilium's network policy, Cilium egress policy, things like that. These, these are held in CRDs. Uh, and it works just fine. It's not going to be a scalability issue that we have to deal with. Cluster mesh state, which I will talk, that's a, I'm setting up the, the loaded gun to talk to in the second act, right? So cluster mesh state is uh, information that, that Cilium will uh, propagate across clusters when you're using Cilium cluster mesh. I'll talk about that in the second act. But right now I wanna talk about CNI state, the information that Cilium has to propagate across nodes to get basic CNI connectivity so that pods uh, across your network or across your cluster can talk to each other and you can enforce um, network policy. It's actually a pretty thin amount of state. Uh, Cilium has a concept called identities, which is how Cilium, it's sort of a core concept, it's how Cilium is able to efficiently apply uh, network policy so that um, multiple pods with the same labels anywhere in your cluster get the same identity and the network policy is applied to that identity. So multiple pods can, have, can share identity, but each of these pods have a unique Cilium endpoint um, resource associated with them. Um, and that's, so endpoints are unique, identities are shared, but all of this has to be uh, consistent across your cluster and all the nodes so that um, the different Cilium agents operating on each node uh, agree on how to handle uh, traffic flow inside the cluster. But this is critical state. It has to propagate for connectivity to work. So when scaling um, Cilium managed clusters up, there are two modes basically of, of installing Cilium uh, such that you can address scale, right? Uh, the default mode, is CRD mode, where everything, those two entities, I should point out, these, these, two, these two resources are just handled like everything else in our CRD. You're gonna use the KAPI server, and that's the default right now. Uh, out of the box is what you're gonna get. But it turns out that if you want to go up to 10,000 nodes, <laughs> and thank you, um, large language model uh, workload uh, users, uh, the, the external, etcd uh, kv store mode is there to get us past 5,000 nodes and up to 10,000 modes reliably. And so this is, uh, so why do we, why do we need that, right? Um, you know, like I said, this is, this is a critical state that has to propagate. And if you hit a problem with the K API server, you have some sort of backup there, some sort of pressure, it can significantly uh, uh, impact your connectivity here. So this is, uh, this is a way around uh, bottlenecks associated with the KAPI server once you're operating at this scale. Uh, just a historic note, this was actually the first mode that was implemented because Cilium is older than CRDs are, right? I think Cilium, Cilium uh, 0 0.9 came out around through the same time that Kubernetes officially released CRDs as a, as a core component uh, in 2017, uh, in the summer of. So, so, should you be relying on Kubernetes CRDs? Absolutely. You should not be doing it this way. The, it should absolutely be such that you can rely on the Kubernetes API server to do this. Um, 
It's interesting though, the documentation actually, when they talk about whether you should actually build custom resources and, or, or build your own API with their own primitives, scalability is not one of the things they have you consider. Like no one anticipated this being like a real problem. It's just in the real world, it is a problem that Selenium users are facing and that's why the etcd mode is still there. Um, so, you know, is using etcd directly worth it? Um, general answer, uh, it's more flexible, but it comes in operational complexity, right? Because there's a lot of, there's a lot of um, time and investment in the KAPI server to manage the etcd that backs it, right? There, the, it caches in front for caching reads. There actually does some, it actually does some uh, lifecycle management for the etcd store itself in terms of compaction and uh, making it easier for the, you to do upgrades or the etcd server that KPI server is backed by. You give all of that up when you uh, need to use uh, this etcd mode in Cilium. And the only reason why you do it is because you're avoiding that uh, performance bottlenecks so that you don't lose connectivity. Like I said, this is very thin. It's actually not very big state, but it's critical, right? So what are those, uh, what are those challenges or those bottlenecks that have historically, historically impacted uh, the, the Kubernetes API server? Well, one, I think this has been known for a very long time now, you know, uh, Kubernetes events can be a fire hose in very active clusters, and actually the, the a mitigation was added to tune this in the API server so that you can actually specify different etcd stores for different parts of your resources um, in the API, um, and that's actually uh, been in there. I forget exactly what release, but it's been, been in there for a while now. Um, the issue, and I'm going to talk about this one a lot, uh, this is sort of the theme actually, is that um, even though Kubernetes watchers exist and etcd watchers exist, uh, watchers aren't free <laughs> and watcher load associated with a uh, high churn, and I will leave that undefined by now, right now, uh, high churn in your cluster uh, can create uh, load, not on just the API server, but on etcd underneath and in very interesting ways. May, well, we'll talk about that. Uh, We'll, we'll, we'll talk, uh, act two, right there, act two. So, so for example, uh, Cube Proxy ran into this with, uh, in, with endpoints. As you, as you churn pods, uh, they found that, that Cube Proxy couldn't deal with that because the object being, ended up being very large um, because you had, to, you had a huge list of endpoints and that created a bottleneck, right? Uh, simply because the objects were quite large. They solved that. Uh, by introducing endpoint slices. So that's solved, it just may not be rolled out in production everywhere, but it's a mitigation that exists. Similarly, Cilium, its endpoint concept is different, but it had the same problem, right? And that problem even shows up when we're using external etcd, it's just that it's not um, as critical because you're able to tune that etcd cluster separately from the KAPI. So um, the third one is uh, CRDs are not equal citizens with core objects yet in the API server because the core objects are actually encoded as binary when they're stored in the etcd um, key value store, whereas CRDs are encoded as JSON. And that actually act has a significant uh, performance burn. It, it may not be enough right now to impact Cilium's need to use etcd for users, but it is there. And so if you're doing a lot of uh, read writes out of etcd with kapi server with with the custom resources you will eventually see this i don't know if it's a pacing item yet but it exists but more but there's a cap there people are aware of it there's actually a binary data format that they're trying to uh, make the standard moving forward so this exists and so these are bottlenecks uh in the kapi server and they should be all solved or in the process of being solved in discussion um so, you know back to Cilium uh, cni state you know, it churns quickly because every time we touch a pod, every time we create a pod, we're changing the CNI state. Uh, it's not expected to be human generated. It's just part of the system. So it's actually a pretty good candidate uh, to do a dedicated etcd um, key value watch here instead of going through the, K, uh, the API server because we don't need a lot of the features of the API server, uh, which are really meant to help you manage as a human. Like we don't need validation for this stuff, for example, because Cilium 
can just do it. We don't expect a human to ever touch this and you know typo anything. So like I said, this is more of a recap talk. There was a great talk in Paris that goes into specifically the watcher load issues. Um, I highly encourage you to look at this and, and wrap your mind around this because uh, it really gets in the question of what high churn is, which is contextual, but it also talks about the details of um, what the watcher load problem looks like. Um, and it's a repeating pattern. Uh, so, you know, wrap up act one, you know, etcdm mode works, but it's not ideal, right? We don't want to have to have users do this because it, it adds complexity to the Cilium itself. We would rather just have to rely on the API server um, and then uh, we don't want to ask cluster administrators to have a need a higher level of expertise in etcd management, right? Because again, there's been investments in a Kubernetes API server to to uh, lower that burden on people. Um, you know, CRDs are probably the future for most Cilium users. Um, there's a desire from both the Cilium side and you know Kubernetes API server side for for this to be performant, right? We don't want to have to do this. Um, uh, I will say this is a personal opinion, cautionary note. You know, this watcher-based uh, uh, data access um, pattern could be everywhere in your cluster. And if you have if you have customized uh, customized components that are using CRDs and you're watching them, this could still be burning you in a way that Cilium could never know about the API server team could never know about, right? Because it becomes down to a data access uh, pattern issue where if you are doing too many watchers, uh, then you create a, a bottleneck for everybody, right? Uh, potentially. So um, I'm expecting that there are some users out there who are pushing the scalable limits right now, even the 10,000 nodes probably have other components that are going to have similar problems, which is why I'm talking about it here. It's not, I don't think it's just a Cilium problem. I think it's, Scalability is a problem for across the landscape. And, um, and as we have uh, users pushing scale, we're gonna see this pop up in other places. So act two, so that was a single cluster and that was more about KAPI. Let's talk about Cilium across uh, multiple clusters. So Cilium has a capability called cluster mesh where you basically are able to run uh, uh, Cilium managed clusters and connect them together in such a way that you're able to define things like uh, global services where you have pods in one cluster being able to communicate with backends or for the same service in another cluster. It gives you some really interesting use cases like failover or regional regional services and a global uh, configuration. I won't, like I said, not a sales pitch is sort of What's interesting is like, this is a new type of scale, right? We're scaling past the bounds of a single cluster and we're, but we're adding connectivity at the multiple cluster level. Everything in this cluster mesh can talk to each other, potentially encrypted tunnels between everybody, um, all made available by Cilium and, and eBPF, the magic of eBPF. Um, what's interesting is uh, the way it's designed is, is we're actually, bypassing KAPA server a little bit. We're using uh, like an embedded etcd proxy here, right? Uh, to do that cross, cross cluster state. We're actually taking a little bit of information from each cluster, replicating it into this etcd and then having readers across clusters uh, watching these, these different etcd stores, right? So every cluster has a dedicated etcd store and every node, every Cilium agent is watching every cluster, right? So agents on all nodes watch everything. So, so assuming you have 10 clusters with 200 nodes each, you're talking about 1800 watchers for each etcd. So if you have, so that's there are 10 clusters there, there's 10 etcd um, uh, servers running that Cilium is maintaining. In. And so each one of those has 1800 watchers for, you know, for all the nodes across. Um, so, you know, why not expose the KAPI server? Well. This is cross cluster. I think this is. A, I think partly it's a design issue. You don't want to do that. You don't want to. You don't want to expose your KPI server across clusters like that. Uh, but when this is really designed, uh, it ends up being prophetic uh, because it actually prevents uh, a scalability issue that's come up and has been mitigated with a new beta feature. But I'll get to that right now. So, just 
to give you some sense of scale of the scalability issue that could pop up here. Cluster mesh allows 255 clusters to talk to each other with 5,000, I should say 10,000. I just said that we can support 10,000, right? So, you know, that's over a million nodes. That's 38 million pods. That's over a million watchers per etcd instance. That's too much. That's going to blow up, right? If someone actually attempted to do that, it would blow up. In fact, it blows up way below that. <laughs> but, uh, you know, what is the actual achievable limits here? Good question, because it really comes down to this churn term, which I have not defined, because churn is contextual. And in the case of cluster mesh, it's not pod churn, but it's actually node churn. If you bring up too many nodes too fast, you end up causing a really big problem for these etcds. Uh, servers and the load becomes too much and the CPU saturates and then everything sort of stops. Uh, like I said, this is becomes, oh, I should say everything. This is across clusters. Everything inside a single cluster is still running, but you're, but these cool global scale services that cluster mesh allows to be defined stop working as you expect because the state is not consistent across all the clusters. Again, it's a matter of scaling the state, not, not the actual functionality of the Linux kernel itself, right? So, what ended up happening is we had to redesign that data access, or I should, or I should say my coworkers or my, the maintainers of Cilium, uh, the, the very expansive we, right? Uh, Cilium uh, basically had to redesign uh, this feature to, uh, to reduce the amount of watchers. So instead of, instead of having every node talk to every cluster, what happens is now clusters uh, talk to each other and then nodes just talk to the etcd inside of its own cluster. Uh, so what happens is 255 clusters theoretical max goes down from 1 million watchers per server to just 5K watchers, or basically a little bit more than the number of nodes in each cluster, right? So, so that is absolutely possible now, right? Uh, that is a significant benefit. The, the trade-off there is that it takes a little longer for for state to populate because you now have to have um, each of the operators um, basically talking to each of the opera other operators, essentially, you know, the Selenium operators. Uh, but nothing falls over. You're not saturating any of those STDs now. It just takes, you've traded off a little bit of uh, initial propagation latency to rely, for li reliability. But again, this is, uh, this is the same design pattern or the same data access pattern that ultimately uh, impacted cube proxy and Cilium on a single cluster where there were too many watchers um, doing too much and um, overwhelmed the ability to, to respond to that. But in this case, there's no KAPI server. This is just etcd by itself. So it's the same data access pattern, even though we've, <laughs> we've cut the, the Kubernetes API server out of the loop. So, so etcd doesn't necessarily solve the problem, but a redesign of the data access does. And this, I think, is what I really want to stress is like, this could be happening everywhere, right, where we're using watchers inside the landscape. And it's just a matter of what scale you hit this. And you might say, yeah, we'll never hit that scale. Uh, I, don't, I don't think people anticipated the scale we're operating at today, five years ago, when some of this stuff was designed. So it may be happening, and so users may be scratching their heads at it because it's, it, it's contextually dependent on what churn causes a problem. And I can't tell you what that churn will be. Like you, you, that's, projects can't tell us what that churn will be. It's sort of, users have to hit it first and when we're all scratching our heads and then we have to figure out how to simulate these ridiculously large <laughs> workloads. So that brings me to the epilogue. Like, why am I up here? Like, you know, scalability testing, I think is important, but it's also super hard. And it's also, the, it's also something project maintainers don't have the resource. We can't just replicate these workloads and testing, right? You can't do it, but you can maybe simulate them. You can maybe, maybe simulate them, right? Like a million nodes, right? Like, or, or when, when, when you have to, when 30 nodes are going up and down in 10 minutes across a global multi-cluster landscape, like we can't test that in the, in the same way that users experience it, but maybe we can simulate it, right?
Um, and like I said, I want to point out to this other talk, and this was from a year ago, Chicago, where the person who was working on KV store mess did a very good job explaining how, to how they were able to reproduce this user experience uh, by doing a simulated workload at scale, or, or a simulated workload that created the, the necessary churn uh, to introduce the problem so that it could be addressed in a redesign, right? Uh, and so it's a matter of being able to consistently see these problems in a testing environment so that it can be addressed uh, by the maintainers. I mean, no, I mean, nobody wants these problems to exist, but man, they're sometimes real hard to catch. So, and so I say Cilium needs more and better scalability tests, but I think all projects probably could use help here. This is a great opportunity for technical contributors who don't necessarily understand the code base, but understand their workloads can actually help here. Like uh, some of the scalability testing it may be as simple as some fun bash scripts, right? Uh, you don't have to be, for us, you don't have to be an eBPF expert. It is not an eBPF issue. This is really uh, uh, about adding scalability testing to catch uh, critical churn in your environments that are happening now. So, so that's my parting thoughts. Like, you know, scalability is a journey. You know, it's hard to anticipate where you're going to hit the next scaling problem. I don't think anybody who are designing these uh, data access patterns expected this, right? Like I know for Cilium, like very, very interested in the UPF to solve some performance issues inside the node. I don't think anyone anticipated this being <laughs> the next problem <laughs> to be experienced, right? Um, you know, churn. Uh, is it critical, but it's also difficult to define, so it's difficult to test for uh, because it's contextual to what an individual uh, project is doing. Uh, in our case, you know, it, it ended up being in one situation it was pod churn, in one situation it was node churn. I don't pod churn. I think we all anticipate, think it's a you know we expect right, but node churn where you where you have to think, oh, what happens if a hundred nodes come online within the next minute? I don't think anyone thought about that. Uh, across a multi-cluster. It's, uh, it's a difficult thing. So, like I said, there's an opportunity here to help from the users uh, because uh, you know your workloads and it's a little bit of effort here uh, to add some scalability testing for every project. And I don't, so if you're using, if you're using Cilium, talk to me. If you're using anything else, talk to your maintainers for the projects you think are critical for your workload uh, and see what they're thinking about. And maybe you can, you can add some expertise and contribute. And then maybe you can win an award like Adobe did for contributions yesterday at the, uh, in the keynote. That'd be really cool. So uh, I think that's it for me. Um, thank you for coming to my talk on the end of the last day of a KubeCon. I really appreciate it. Uh, I am three minutes ahead of time, but we have like seven minutes for questions. So if, if there are questions, I can maybe try to answer them. Otherwise, thank you very much. There it is. He's from five minutes in, he was ready to ask a question. Read writes, uh, size of the keys, like what's the, like you mentioned churn, but churn is of how much data did you write or how much writes did you did? Right, so I will repeat that because I'm not sure if that mic was hot. The question was, what was the ultimately the limiting uh, consideration? Is it read writes or is it the size of the data? Uh, what is churn? Good questions. It depends. Uh, my understanding, and, and I'm, I, am, I am not a uh, maintainer, so I may get this wrong, but this is my understanding right now. For QProxy, you know, in the, uh, in the itself, when they introduced, based on my understanding, uh, when they introduced endpoint slices, it ended up being the size of the objects. As you added an endpoint, uh, it ended up being, uh, you just had a huge array of endpoints for some of these services and moving the, uh, updating the service became a problem because the size of each object was big. So they ad added the slices concept and it helped reduce that. For Cilium, it was the amount of read writes, I believe, uh, because the size of the objects, I think, aren't that of a big of a deal. But, but that's, my, that's my understanding right now. But, um, so it can depend, and, and for uh, cluster mesh specifically, it was, it was the overall uh, amounts of, of, of read, reads. Um, because as you bring up 50 nodes, you're just asking for things to do a lot of work. 
So, and like I said, like that's, and it's different scales. Like for, for the endpoint stuff, it was pod churn, right? Inside of a single cluster. For the cluster mesh, it was node churn across the entire global span of, the, of, your, of your entire infrastructure. Uh, which is a di you know, different different churn for different problems. So I can only speak to how Cilium works because it's, you know, because it's uh, deeply related to CNI. But I imagine other projects have other issues where churn uh, will show up and cause some sort of performance issue. Does that answer the question? Sure. Thank you. Thanks. Uh oh. Uh, have you looked at um, other data stores other than at CD? Have we looked at other data stores other than etcd? I have not. Uh, I wanted to uh, avoid that discussion because it just complicates things a little bit. Uh, I, think, I think scalability testing will always depend on the technology you use, but at some point you will have a problem in a place that you're not, you were not expecting it, right? So, um, so this isn't so much about picking, uh, going, etcd isn't, good enough. I actually think etcd is good enough. It was just a matter of the, the, act, the data access patterns. We can mess that up with anything, right? There's a, way, there's a way to use any data store inefficiently, right? So it's a matter of catching those patterns in the system. Yeah, I, I mean, there are other data stores that are, have different like consistency guarantees, yeah. but are more scalable. Yeah, in fact, like I, I sort of mentioned that, I sort of asked it's like most Kubernetes clusters are using etcd, but I know there are people who are working to, to sort of make this a specification so that you don't have to use etcd. But I don't, this isn't a technology technology, I was more about the patterns of, of you know, leading to scalability. This happened, just, just happens to be the ones that we're hitting right now in Cilium, right? Because we just didn't anticipate data access patterns being a problem, right? Because we were focused on eBPF solving some scalability problems in the node, so. But I get where you're coming from, yeah. I get where you're coming from, it's just not, not this talk. I think there was a talk earlier about uh, maybe replacing etcd with something else. And I know, I know it's out there, so. Oh, there's one later, okay, yeah. 420, there's a uh, progress SQL. Yeah, yeah, I, and I'm aware of that, I'm a, but that's, you know, I, I didn't want that to be the focus of the talk. I'm not trying to beat up any project. This is just about patterns where I think users can help any project uh, uh, address this, right? If we have tools to kind of play with the scalability of uh, Cilium, I think I wrote one that generated a ton of uh, Cilium identity operators. Is SIG scalability in the Cilium Slack the right place to come to discuss that? Or yeah, absolutely. In fact, I mean, it, it absolutely is. Um, and like I said, if you, if you looked at if you look at Drew's um, uh, talk from last year, right? He did some excellent work uh, to do a mock-up tool too. So, but uh, yeah, and like, please. Please help us. In fact, like I said, every project probably wants users who are doing this, some in-house for your own testing to help contribute so we can get a framework, maybe a framework across the landscape where we can start doing this in an organized way. Hi. Uh, so you mentioned that uh, you, I mean, shard the etcd so that you are able to uh, send the events to a different etcd using the etcd oh. server overrides. Oh, I'm, I mentioned that as a, as a historical mitigation for these sort of bottlenecks. Like, you know, the API server maintainers, you know, as these things come up, they do mitigate them. And I think that's one of the oldest mitigations uh, in terms of the design is being able to, uh, instead of using a single etcd, you can, yeah. you can take part of your resource uh, set and moving it on. It started with just events, but then it, it actually got more generalized, so you can tune it to groups. Um, but you know, it's, that's the first, that was the first mitigation I'm aware of. Yeah, that's true. I mean, we do that as well in the Gardner project. Uh, but what we realized later on is that we can do this only for native KTS resources, but right. not for CRDs. Right. So is that a pain point for you as well? Uh, well, I, well, I think we avoided that <laughs> by just doing our own etcd. Uh, but do you see value in being able to do that for CRDs natively? If oh, let's say CRDs I, are now stored as binary? Yeah, I think, I think everyone wins. If we if we can make a, the, uh, the Kubernetes API server performant, right? The first thing is once we start 
having CRDs binary encoded, that should help, that should make it possible or easier and easier, right? But I agree, like, if you could take that further, the more, the more you bake it in into the API server, the less of these, it's not a hack, it's just workarounds. Um, and then we all benefit, like the more, the more we can drive this to the API server, the, and then we, we don't have to have individualized solutions, so. Thank you. Yep. I think that's it, I got 34 seconds. Hopefully that's the last question. Thank you everybody for coming to my talk. <laughs>